Welcome to the COVID-19 What Pharmacists Know Now series, brought to you by the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists, BC branch. My name is Tasha Ramsey. I'm an infectious diseases pharmacist for Nova Scotia Health, which is the Provincial Hospital Health Authority here in Nova Scotia. I also co-chair our Nova Scotia COVID-19 Therapeutics and Prophylactics Advisory Group that provides medication recommendations to our Department of Health and Wellness to aid pharmacare decisions, and to Nova Scotia Health to aid decisions related to COVID medication use in hospital. I'm also an assistant professor with the College of Pharmacy at Dalhousie University. In this session, Colchicine, Goat Reliever by Day, COVID-19 Treatment by Night, we will explore the use of Colchicine and COVID-19. In terms of disclosure, I have no conflicts of interest or financial or personal relationships to declare. One important disclaimer is that, as we all know at this point, COVID-19 evidence is very rapidly evolving. And the information in the presentation today is based on the best available evidence available on February 19th, 2021. Also, the views in this presentation are my own and do not reflect those of the BC branch of CSHP. By the end of this presentation, it's my hope that you will be able to broadly describe the proposed mechanism for colchicine and COVID-19, be familiar with the evidence for colchicine and the treatment of COVID-19, and be able to discuss the results of the cold corona study. I'm sure that we're all familiar with colchicine. This commonly used goat agent is used to relieve pain in acute goat flares and used for prophylaxis of recurrent goat flares. The approved Health Canada indications and off-label indications are listed here. One off-label indication is the prevention of primary and secondary pericarditis, and you may also discuss this in hospital too. It's important to note, unlike some of the other COVID-19 agents like remdesivir or bamlanivimab, Health Canada has not authorized colchicine for treatment of COVID-19, either as an interim order or as an approval with conditions. When it comes to the mechanism of COVID-19 therapeutics, it's important to reflect on where they act in the disease course. This figure shows disease progression towards the bottom of the image in gray bars going from left to right. Starting on the left, day zero corresponds to viral entry. The next bar, day one to two, represents viral replication in the airway cells, and this is when antivirals will have the most benefit. You can then see day three to seven, activation of your inflammatory response, and agents that target your immune system, such as dexamethasone, either broadly or through specific targets, are proposed to work here best. Next up is day 7 to 14, which corresponds to week 2 of illness, and is when those that go on to have very severe disease usually fall the most ill, and this is as a result of dysregulated inflammatory response, or ARDS. Once again, immunomodulatory agents may have a role here too. However, it's felt that if you use them earlier on, they'll likely have more benefit before things get out of control. So broadly, you can see that COVID-19 therapeutics fall into one of two categories, antiviral or immunomodulatory, that will either work very early or later on in the disease course. So where does colchicine fall? Is it an antiviral or is it an immunomodulatory agent? It's thought to act mainly as an immunomodulatory agent. The exact mechanism is complex. It reduces systemic inflammation by blocking cytokine release and other inflammatory markers shown in this figure. This is going to include tumor necrosis factor reduction, disruption of superoxide production, and inflammasome inhibition. So, what does the literature search for colchicine and COVID-19 reveal? Initially, there were case series and reports published outlining the proposed mechanism and use in a few patients. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there are also numerous ongoing and completed trials not yet published assessing various COVID-19 populations, including outpatients and inpatients. There's one phase one study that had 35 patients based out of Brazil by Lopez et al. and it's in preprint. And there are two phase two studies reporting results, the Greco-19 study, which has been published, and one that's based out of Iran that's available as a preprint. The first of the phase two studies is Greco-19. This stands for the Greek study in the effects of colchicine and COVID-19 complications prevention study. It's a phase two open label prospective RCT that explored the use of colchicine versus standard medical treatment and hospitalized patients with COVID-19 and they used up to three weeks of colchicine. The primary clinical outcome was deterioration defined by two points on the World Health Organization seven grade clinical status scale, ranging from being able to resume normal activities all the way up to death. Secondary outcomes included cumulative event-free 10 day survival and side effects including diarrhea. 
Greco-19 found the rate of clinical deterioration to be higher in the control group than in the colchicine group. The cumulative event-free 10-day survival was 97% in the colchicine group and 83% in the control group. Adverse events were similar in the two groups, except for diarrhea, which was much more frequent in the colchicine group than the control group. So as you can see here, 45.5% in the colchicine group experienced diarrhea versus 18% in the control group. The outcomes on this slide were all statistically significant, and just to comment on mortality, there was one death in the colchicine group and four in the standard medical treatment arm. The next phase two RCT that is release data as a preprint was completed in Iran. It was a prospective, open-label, double-blind RCT in 100 hospitalized patients with COVID-19. They looked at colchicine at a dose of one milligram daily for six days. And this was used in addition to standard medical therapy, which they defined to be at the time hydroxychloroquine. And they then compared this combination to standard medical therapy, which also, of course, included hydroxychloroquine. So what you're really kind of looking at in the end is colchicine plus hydroxychloroquine versus hydroxychloroquine. The primary outcome was length of hospitalization and secondary outcomes included COVID symptoms, one of them being dyspnea. So they found a statistically significant reduction in length of hospitalization, with hospitalization being about one and a half days less than the colchicine group. There was no difference in dyspnea and no one died during the study. There were also no statistically significant differences in side effects and they, even though they say this, they didn't report some of the ones that I was looking to see. So for example, diarrhea wasn't reported at all. So up to this point, we've talked about the phase two data that's available. And this is really all that you would have found up until a few weeks ago. For phase three study, there's the cold corona study that created a lot of buzz a few weeks ago with its media release and preprint. There's also Oxford's recovery trial, which added a colchicine arm in November of 2020. However, no results have been released either by preprint or have been published yet. So I mentioned there was a lot of buzz about colchicine last month. On January 22nd, a press release came out from the Montreal Heart Institute, and there was a lot of news coverage that followed. Initially, this coverage was very favorable, and it promoted the efficacy of colchicine. The press release stated that the rate of hospitalization or death was 21% lower among participants in the cold corona study who received colchicine compared to those who were randomly assigned to placebo. Over the next few days, the preprint was released and the reaction in the media became mixed. Some were concluding there's little benefit and the overall findings were not statistically significant. There were also comments about needing to exercise caution when interpreting press release statements in the absence of published peer reviewed data or at least having the preprint results available. Also, the College of Physicians and the Order of Pharmacists in Quebec advised against using colchicine for COVID-19 as part of routine care due to a lack of evidence of efficacy and the associated toxicities. So which one is it? Is colchicine a slam dunk for COVID-19 or not? The preprint of the cold corona study came out shortly after the press release, and you're probably wondering, what does the preprint say? So cold corona is a phase three randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled multicenter study based at the Montreal Heart Institute. Patients were outpatients. They were aged 40 and up. They had a COVID diagnosis within the past 24 hours and met at least one high-risk criteria, including things like baseline pulmonary disease, obesity, or being greater than 70 years of age. You'll note this is a very large study, so it included just shy of 4,500 people. For the setting, it was an at-home contactless trial, and it was conducted in Canada. It included the provinces of British Columbia, Ontario and Quebec, the United States, Spain, Greece, Brazil and South Africa. The intervention was 0.5 milligrams of colchicine, BID for three days, and then 0.5 milligrams daily for 27 days, and it was compared to placebo. The primary objective was to determine whether short-term treatment with colchicine reduced the rate of death or hospitalizations, which was a composite outcome, related to COVID-19. Secondary outcomes include diarrhea and pulmonary embolism. The primary outcome of death or hospitalization for COVID-19 by day 30 was not statistically significant. However, when they excluded 329 patients from analysis and looked only at their PCR-confirmed COVID-19 population, the primary outcome just met statistical significance. There was no difference in death. 
For the safety outcomes, they report on patients who took at least one dose of the trial medication and found that 14% versus 7% of patients had diarrhea in the colchicine group and placebo groups respectively. More concerning, and what's raised a lot of red flags, is the fact that there was a statistically significant difference in the pulmonary embolism rates, where you can see that 11 patients in the colchicine group and two in the placebo group had a PE. Where the rates of side effects were relatively high compared to the questionable efficacy, and there's this serious adverse event of PE being higher in the colchicine group, many feel that cold corona shows colchicine may not have a favorable risk-benefit profile for O patients with COVID-19. And if you're wondering what do the guidelines say, our Canadian PHAC and AMI endorsed COVID-19 guidelines, and the American NIH guidelines do not address colchicine for the treatment of COVID-19. So now that we've finished reviewing the evidence, there are a few practical considerations to review. One is that the colchicine dose being studied, it's fairly high and adverse effects are predictably common with it. Also, the 0.5 milligram tablets are not marketed in Canada. So we have 0.6 milligram tablets available here. Colchicine is also a narrow therapeutic index drug. And you have to keep in mind that it has renal and hepatic dependent clearance. So therefore, you have to really consider toxicity, especially in our sicker patients with COVID-19 that can have renal and hepatic dysfunction. There's also potential for CYP-P450 and PGP drug interactions. Finally, it's important to note that there's a lack of federal support for colchicine at this point. So what I mean by this is that some other medications for COVID-19, including remdesivir and bamlanivimab, are obtained by the federal government and distributed out to the provinces free of charge. That's not the case with colchicine. Colchicine also does not have a conditional approval from Health Canada or an interim order for COVID-19. So does colchicine have a role in the treatment of COVID-19? Despite having a large sample size, cold corona could not find a statistically significant benefit for their primary outcome, which once again was a composite of death or hospitalization. And it's only when they excluded 329 patients in a subgroup analysis of those PCR-confirmed cases that they just met statistical significance. Diarrhea was reported at significantly higher rates in the colchicine group. And pulmonary embolism, which is a very serious side effect, we know that its rates were higher in the colchicine group. In terms of practical considerations, it's not the easiest medication to take or without side effects or without drug interactions. Also, the 0.5 milligram formulation is not available in Canada, and we've already discussed the lack of federal support. And so in conclusion, I think the role of colchicine in the treatment of COVID-19 is currently unclear. Many feel we should wait until we have more information to see if there is a population with a better risk-benefit profile. Thank you so much for watching the session. Stay safe, everyone.